Welcome. This is Jack Dempsey. I'm a director at Definitive Logic. It's a technology company that looks at integrating technology and asset management simply to make good decisions uh, for our clients uh, who own assets. Um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Thad Allen, uh, who is a former commandant of the Coast Guard and was also active on the national stage, uh, leading the, uh, the cleanup uh, for the Katrina hurricane that uh, damaged so much of our uh, uh, southern part of the country. Um, what we're talking about today is asset management, and, and the particular element that we're really looking at is, uh, I think, what uh, Thad Allen really has a lot of credit for, certainly for some of us here on the call, and I think many of our, uh, others who will be listening to this uh, presentation, is as a commandant, he uh, established a vision for uh, what was called then the mission support business model, but it was a common way of how the Coast Guard could look across its asset portfolio, organize investments and uh, resource management decision-making related to them, focus on mission, but always managing risk and always making, uh, seeking to make better decisions. Uh, there's a number of elements of that that really kind of came to be it, it's undeniable the impact that that's had uh, in, in the uh, federal community uh, today, Department of Defense, uh, Veterans Affairs, uh, that Department of Homeland Security are all uh, active in the area of asset management and seeking to try to apply that. Um, one of the lenses that was used was product line management and the decision making around that. So. With that, I'd like to welcome uh, Admiral Allen uh, to share his thoughts on how his vision for asset man um, kind of echoed across uh, the federal agency, his perspectives of that. Um, and more importantly, or also importantly, would be how that is a tr uh, translated into the digitization, the technology enablement, because as agencies and large organizations are challenged with trying to make good decisions, being agile, risk-based. Uh, they also need to incorporate technology in that in that vision. So, with that, um, Admiral, we welcome you today, and really interested to hearing your thoughts and vision on uh, where this came from and where do you think it's going. And uh, thank you for your leadership and your your career-long work in this area. It's one of those things that's, in my view, critically important to effective enterprise management. Uh, doesn't get a lot of visibility and for many years wasn't talked about, but it's like kind of like blocking and tackling. If you're going to score a touchdown, you better have the basics right going in. And I've always thought that these were some of the basics on how you actually manage a, uh, an enterprise over my career. Uh, two thoughts come to mind when I was listening to your introduction. When I was a uh, mid-grade and junior officer, two things happened that really stuck in my mind. One of them was I was a commanding officer at a Coast Guard unit where they came in and they repaved our parking lot. And then two months later, they came in and they dug it up to put a new electrical cable in. And I couldn't believe that we would do that as an organization, only to a few years later to see us uh, get a bunch of money and a supplemental appropriations to buy brand new patrol boats for the Coast Guard that ultimately would be deployed to the, to the Middle East and have been over there for quite a while now. Uh, we didn't understand until after they were under construction that, number one, their draft wouldn't allow them to fit at the docks where our current patrol boats were at, and the electrical short tie system that provided power to them was not going to work either. It required a multi-million dollar uh, investment uh, to create the home port for these, uh, these vessels to actually operate out of. So as I went through my career, I was mindful every time we made these mistakes where we weren't centrally integrating our planning and our execution. We also really didn't understand how the assets were related to each other. In this case, a floating asset or a cutter related to the home port, the pier, and everything else. And it's all integrated to uh, achieve the proper mission support that you need to be able to do that. Uh, when I ultimately uh, was promoted to flag rank and became the director of resources in the Coast Guard, I had a long experience working with our shore facilities. And many times they did not get the uh, maintenance and the recapitalization that they needed because they didn't compete well with cutters and aircraft. And that's obvious in an operational organization. But we really didn't understand what I would call the return on mission that these facilities really create. And they need to have a steady uh, foundation facility-wise if we're going to actually uh, achieve the optimum mission execution we want. And also to reduce risk and increase resiliency. We found out some some major storms and having to uh, deal with uh, the damage to our bases and so forth. 
So uh, this would be back around the, uh, the mid 1990s to late 1990s. We started dealing with something called Shore Facilities Capital Asset Management or SFCAM, we called it. And that was ability to holistically look at all of our facilities across the Coast Guard as they related to other things like aircraft operations and cutter operations. It was our first attempt to kind of rationalize uh, from an enterprise standpoint, uh, how we actually build, viewed all these so we would make better decisions. We had meager funds to repair and replace these stations. So it was a way to actually think about it. Ultimately, when I became commandant, uh, I laid out a mandate for the entire service to go to the same mission support organizational structure, which would include a center of excellence for every type of asset that we were trying to manage. And then product line managers that would be responsible for the life cycle of those assets. And that's whether it was a piece of electronics or a small boat or a cutter or a large cutter. Uh, the, the, fir the first time we tried to do this was something called the Surface Forces Logistics Center at Curtis Bay, Maryland. And the actual the naval engineering community, the small boat community actually reacted very negatively to this. They didn't want to be told how to manage their assets. So they, did, they, they thought they were losing autonomy. It got so bad that I fired the commanding officer of the Surface Forces Logistics Center, who was a naval engineer. And I replaced him with an aviation engineer because our aviation community had got a handle on this many years earlier on configuration management, tool control, uh, preventive maintenance systems and everything else. We've, the Coast Guard has now been able to make that the central enterprise framework on how they support all their assets moving forward. The reason I think it's been really important that they did that, not only because it's inherently uh, the right way to run the organization, reduces risk and increases resiliency. As we moved into modern technology where we're at today, it's even more incumbent that we understand how these facilities are integrated. <clears throat> the best example I can probably give to that are industrial control system and SCADA systems in which we have things like uh, our HVAC systems for buildings, how we're connected in terms of our uh, IT backbone. And we all know there are significant cyber threats right now. Well, uh, if we didn't think our facilities were connected before in terms of how they were integrated into mission, they're now completely integrated in terms of threat uh, because they're all part of the attack surface for uh, potential cyber attacks and issues related to that, even including uh, where we have embedded uh, uh, GPS chips, which are uh, so, uh, are so, so capable of being uh, uh, jammed and uh, the, the data being, uh, being messed with by our opponents out there. So I would think, uh, since we're talking about the State Department having traveled uh, around the world quite a bit and been to many uh, State Department facilities around the world, I would think that a lot of those same challenges exist, especially if you look at the fact that you have to have secure spaces in your facilities and you have the, the continuing connectivity and the IT challenge and the cybersecurity challenge. In addition to that, as I said earlier, all these facilities now have industrial control systems that work for their HVAC units and so forth. So I think from a, a risk management standpoint, from a resource management standpoint, for a way to be more effective and efficient, large company like Sodexo have found out there's actually a business case to actually make this happen. I think it's, a, it's incumbent on all of us as money gets tight and we're all competing for scarce resources and we look at the most effective way to link together uh, the tools we use, not only where we live and how we operate and the, uh, and the uh, platforms we use, but how that affects our everyday lives and how we actually manage that. And I would think in, a, in the digital age that we live in right now, where we're still trying to learn how to be digital citizens and digital organization, this takes on even a higher premium. Uh, so I couldn't urge you in stronger terms uh, to take a look at how you collectively see the entire State Department infrastructure and facilities as a system that supports uh, mission execution and seriously consider how you might want to manage that moving forward and uh, take on a new way to, to, to look at your organizational structure and a way to explain this to senior leadership so it creates a value proposition that will create the buy-in you'll need to make the changes that you need to be successful at this. So it's been a pleasure to talk to you all this morning. And Jack, I'd be glad to take a few questions if there's time. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll start off with one one really important one, um, and you kind of highlighted a little bit about it. it it's all about change. Um, one, one thing that I find very interesting in the ISO fifty five thousand standards, it, it really focuses on um, you know organizational behavior, motivations, uh, culture, even, and a lot of this change is, is is sometimes overwhelming for organizations who are very focused on mission, on some tactical execution. Um, one of the uh, phrases that I, I remember you saying often was uh, tyranny of the present. Um, what, 
from your perspective, um, are important factors that organizations need to consider in terms of motivating and supporting change and supporting the individuals that, uh, that need to kind of champion this change? I mean, what works and what doesn't work? Well, let's start with the uh, tyranny of the present line, which I have used throughout my career. Sometimes we get so obsessed with the annual budget cycle and the processes that we have to do every day as a condition of operation or employment, that we kind of lose uh, track of where it is we're trying to go. And sometimes just meeting those requirements every year uh, becomes the goal when really uh, it's, it's like playing cards and that's only the ante to get into the game. And the question is, you know, how stable are you going to make the current status that you're in right now so you can actually adapt to change, be more agile, and be a change-centric organizations. And you can't do that by focusing on just what you could control in an annual cycle uh, on how you operate. So that requires you to kind of break down the, uh, the, the barriers uh, horizontally and vertically in organizations, start talking about common purpose in support of a mission execution, and then this contribution to mission execution that everybody makes together and the synergistic uh, outcomes you can achieve when everybody starts to focus on this the same way. And a facility is a facility, whether it's in uh, you know, Copenhagen or, or Canberra, Australia, or wherever, uh, there's certain things you have to do. There's connectivity, there's IT structures and everything else. So uh, there is no uh, enterprise in the entire world. And even the Coast Guard, as good as they have gotten, still have room to improve. Uh, they can't do better than they are right now. You know, one common um, term that I hear a lot in the military is uh, unity of purpose or unity of effort. Um, what, what factors, um, in your opinion, are really important to, uh, to establish that and even kind of leading to a culture where there's this uh, esprit de corps or team, teamwork that, uh, that leads, to, leads an organization to, to make these changes? Well, you know, there's a career progression that people go through. Uh, and then it doesn't continue. And what I mean is uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get a specialty. It doesn't matter what branch of the service or even the State Department, you'll have a specialty in what you do for, uh, for a living. And you become a technical expert on that. As you go through 5, 10, 15 years, you become a journeyman, you become a, a, an expert, and you have these, this career craft that you develop. Part of that is program management and defending your program and, and acquiring resources. And when everybody does that, then it, they, it looks to be a zero sum game where uh, if I don't get it, it's at somebody else's cost or I'm supporting somebody else. That kind of defeats a purpose. And at some point where you're gonna make the transition from mid-level management, whether it's in the military, uh, civilian and state department or the private sector, you have to learn how as a leader to subordinate parochial interest in light of the greater good you're trying to achieve in terms of what the organization and enterprise are trying to do. When I used to write the precept for uh, flag boards, the boards that, that uh, select new admirals, one of the traits that I looked for and people that, need, that I was looking to promote or get promoted was their ability to discern when they need to pull off their uh, support for a particular program, which they would normally uh, throw themselves on a hand grenade for and understand how you have to compromise and bring this stuff together and subordinate your parochial interest uh, to bring the entire framework forward. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's a lesson that our Congress could use right now, by the way. Uh, and it's one of the hardest things to learn as you go up through an organization when you move from a technical expert to a program manager to really what I would call an enterprise leader. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean that, that, that's great insight. And, and of course, um, you know, very important to how an organization might, um, um, you know, grow its leaders, so to speak. Um, I'll end with one quick question that's handed over to Jim here. Um, one thing you did in the Coast Guard that I think is also somewhat remarkable is you, you looked at the transcendence of what asset management is, uh, as we call it today. There was uh, personal property, aviation assets, surface assets, um, shore infrastructure assets that all um, were part of this common business model. And um, I guess what, what really drove you to seeing that that was necessary for the organization to think on those terms for it to be successful? Well, uh, you could make a value proposition. And I actually, I went out and I probably talked to 30,000 people over, over uh, two or three years trying to establish the programs that I put in place when I was commandant. Uh, there's a value proposition they need to understand it, but I also had to come up with examples where when we didn't do this, we had problems or we had mishaps or we had severe problems as, as a result of it. Um, but I'll tell you the other thing that was a big hammer, it, it was a financial audit. 
people tend to forget that, you know, we can't escape these requirements uh, for clean financial audits. And it's really been a challenge, as you know, within uh, DOD. Uh, the Coast Guard has been able to establish a clean audit for several years now, although we're shifting to a new financial management system uh, as part of a larger uh, initiative inside DHS right now. Uh, but you're not going to get a clean audit and you're not going to be able to represent the, uh, the findings of that audit in, in a credible way unless you have control of your plant property and equipment and you can actually account for it. So that, that, that would be the other, um, uh, not only a business, but a regulatory you know, requirement that you got to meet. Uh, absolutely. And actually, um, you know, a little bit on the, on the, on the side, we work with the definitive logic and the technology um, supporting some of those efforts, it's great to see organizations really kind of step up to the plate on that. Um, with that, Jim, to you, I, I know you have some additional questions. Oh, I'm just, it's always awesome to hear uh, Admiral Allen speak. Uh, the words, couple words stick out for me today. Uh, in the ISO 55,000 effort that uh, Jack and I, and of course, people around the world are involved in. Uh, you know, we talk about top management, we talk about leadership, but I don't know that we've ever used the word decisive. And uh, it really comes across strongly that that decisive factor of uh, being confident in what you're doing, having done your homework, and, and take that action. Uh, is there anything further you can say about that? To uh, how do we how do we uh, inspire our leaders, and how do we help them be decisive? Well, I think there are a couple of drivers for that right now. Uh, one is the, rap the rapidity of uh, technological change. Uh, you know, the government's always in a stern chase in acquiring technology, either acquiring it and deploying it to any kind of mission effect. And then for some uh, agencies like the Coast Guard to understand the technology because you have to conduct oversight and regulatory, you know, functions associated with it. A big one for the Coast Guard right now is uh, cybersecurity for facilities and ports. So, uh, there are two things that I that I think are going to make decisive leaders, especially in crises. Uh, and it's not rocket science. Happy to share them. One is lifelong learning. The other one's emotional intelligence. Uh, when the oil rigs blew on the 20th of April, 2010, I did not know what a blowout preventer was. Uh, two weeks later, I had a pointer was standing in the White House press office explaining everything to the United States on CNN. Uh, so I had a pretty steep <laughs> learning curve. Uh, so there's a premium, especially with the rapid technology and the digital world we live in right now, there's a real premium being placed on leaders to not stop learning. You know, it's kind of a simple equation. You can never know everything, so you can never know enough, so you should never stop trying to learn. And then that applies to how you run your organization as well. And emotional intelligence means, uh, you know, have an empathy, listen to other points of view. And those are the things that are required to create the unity of effort where you can actually bring these organizational structures together and create a common cause for what you need to do. And if you demonstrate that and you demonstrate uh, through your actions, the, the content of your character and your behavior, the, the people will follow you at some point. That's, a, that's an awesome answer. Thank you, sir. The, the other word that sticks out to me is uh, a word we been, have been discussing at great length in uh, our rewrite of ISO 55,000, and that's integration, which has maybe had been mentioned before, but now we're elevating to the concept of being a principal. Really, this asset management needs to be integrated within uh, the management structures and systems of the organization. And uh, to bring all those asset types and the various organizations together. Uh, I know you've talked about that some, but uh, anything else you can share with us about you know, actually achieving that. I mean, theoretically, it's so simple, but uh, uh, in practice, it seems to be uh, a huge, a huge effort to uh, make it happen. Well, I don't believe in the current technology environment. There's a choice here. Um, if you look at the Internet of Things, you know, I, I'm sitting here talking to you, but I can pick up my phone and run my toaster right now if I needed to. Um, <laughs> and so there's no part of an organizational structure that's not impacted by uh, you know the digitized world we live in and the technical world we live in and therefore whether you understand it or not there's kind of this neural network that's been created that connects everything in the enterprise together so you can look at it two ways uh, from a risk standpoint would you want would you not want to understand that and the risk that was entailed about how that's connected and what could happen and the, the amount of tax surface that is 
And on the other hand, uh, wouldn't you want to know if there was more value to be obtained by having everybody networked? And, uh, you know, I, uh, what, one, of, one of the phrases I've used throughout my life, uh, transparency of information breeds self-correcting behavior. And if you have enough information out there and it's all shared by everybody, they become self-directed. You don't have to get orders and everything runs smoothly and you remove a lot of friction uh, from how organizations run. But it's based on shared information that everybody holds and can create a common purpose from because it's pretty, sometimes it's, pre it's pretty apparent what you need to do if everybody holds the same information. Uh, I mean, it's the, uh, it, it's the same thing that the military has used for, work, used for years in network-centric uh, warfare where you have a distributed common operating picture and you might have a, a, a missile shooter someplace and you may have an airplane flying, but they're all using the same operating picture and it's a coordinated operation on how they work. Uh, we're just moving this to an enterprise level. It's actually how we've been fighting for, uh, for decades. Mm. So let me ask one more. Is uh, the, the most common question we get is, so what's the return on investment? And we tell people, well, we're still, at the early adopter phase and you know once we have all this figured out so it's plug and play it'll be uh, you know all those answers or questions will be easy to answer but uh, you have uh, experience you can share on you know where it made the where your approach to asset management made a difference uh, in the bottom line or the key sure. metrics you were tracking um, when we stood up the Surface Forces Logistics Center in Curtis Bay, Maryland, where the Coast Guard uh, yard is at, the dry dock we have, and we moved our old cutters uh, to uh, product line management, we were able to get more operational hours at lower cost out of cutters that were 50 years old than we ever had before. It was because we were applying uh, configuration management uh, rather than people trying to figure out how to fix uh, ships on different coasts. Uh, there was a central coordinating authority and again, configuration management, uh, common maintenance procedures, and those types of things. You have to change the culture and make everybody kind of buy into that. Um, but uh, and, and there's still corners of the Coast Guard where they're working on this. Of course, I don't I, I don't run the service anymore, uh, but I stay in touch enough to know that uh, that this is slowly being ingrained in the culture and everybody gets it. And people that used to say, you know, I run a small boat station, I'll take care of my boats, leave me alone, now understand that I can do this better if I'm part of this larger enterprise system. And I'm linked into this larger. Uh, it's 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 like using an expert management system if you're in kind of any profession uh, to help you be more successful. Well, that's awesome, sir. Uh, it's always been a, a, a great pleasure to the ALN uh, to host you at past events, and it's uh, been a great pleasure to have you uh, with us today. Jack, uh, any last words? I guess uh, you know. An element of advice to uh, maybe executives in, in the federal sector, I know you kind of talked a little bit about Congress's role here, but are there uh, senior leaders that um, anything that they should be thinking about in terms of what they could be doing to advance their organization uh, forward in this, in this, in this way? Uh, a mentor and somebody I respect very much, uh, Mike Mullen, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff when he retired, said the greatest a threat to our national security is the national debt. Uh, resources are gonna continue to be scarce. We're gonna have to wring every ounce of value we can out of what we already own and how we make investments moving forward. Uh, so I would say uh, there's, there's little alternative than to do this unless you wanna face obsolescence. You know, there's a, there's a basic uh, accounting principle that when you go in to take a look at somebody's books that they're a going concern, that they intend to remain in business, they don't intend to go out of business. Uh, I, I would think if you're gonna be a going concern in government these days, you have to be agile, you have to start looking at resources and budgeting uh, with the amount of the budget that is non-discretionary right now, the writing's pretty much on the wall. Uh, those who are efficient and understand how to do this will, uh, will survive. Thank you, sir. Really do appreciate that. My pleasure.